is, is a miracle. It really is amazing the popularity and, and staying power that Scooby has had. When we first started, I, they, obviously you had no idea that this show was going to be such a, a smash hit. It has an appeal that just seems to cross generations. He's a talking dog. He's goofy. He eats his face off constantly. It's got an alchemy. It's just like all of the pieces sort of came together in an unexpected way and created something totally new. It's timeless. How could anyone not like a talking dog to solve mysteries? <laughs> Start looking for something out of the ordinary. Take a good look around. My first memories of watching Scooby-Doo were just on the couch by myself, latchkey kid with a tub of ice cream, like eating things I shouldn't be eating and watching Scooby-Doo. My earliest memory of Scooby-Doo was when I was a little kid watching them on Saturday morning TV when you only had three channels. I got up early and I watched whatever else I had to watch and the show came on and the bats flew out and there was this noise as the bats fly out. And I turned off the TV, and I didn't watch it for about six years. <laughs> the original cartoon series, Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? The episode was called A Tiki Scare is No Fair. And that witch doctor creeped me out, man. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but <laughs> Although it's a mystery, the mystery is not that deep. And although it's supposed to be uh, scary, it is not that scary. But you have Scooby and Shaggy. Science ghosts! Ghosts! They're really close buddies. And they're slackers. There's no pro-social value to their friendship. It is just silliness. And I think that is what kids respond to. It's only a tree branch. I knew it all the time. <laughs> I think it was Iwo Takamoto's designs, because Iwo has a way of designing appeal. The style is very simple and pleasant to look at. And so as a kid, I just enjoyed that whole style. It's kind of flat, but there was something charming about that. It just was appealing to the eye. And it's a hard design to capture, which is kind of interesting, because I remember when we did the Johnny Bravo meets Scooby-Doo episode, trying to draw Scooby-Doo. It looks so simple, yet it's so complex. So it's a nice combination of simplicity and complexity that made it interesting. Well, the networks didn't really have as much play into the character to begin with. You know, it was just something that we decided to have a big, goofy Great Dane. As soon as you started writing the character, then he started coming alive, and you started seeing not only is he, he's a lot of fun, he's so lovable. That was the biggest thing. What a creaky, creepy place. When you look at those characters, they are characters kind of frozen in time. And they're not really what hippies or hipsters or, or cool kids were like. They're kind of like what 50-year-old guys thought kids were at that time. They have sort of a, a lineage from other shows, sort of like uh, maybe Adobe Gillis. It's got a little bit of Hardy Boys in it. It's got a little bit of the Archies, that sort of teen gang thing. We picked on something familiar to kind of give us the impetus for those kind of characters. Maybe that gave them kind of an eternal, youthful quality. The style was, was kind of quaint and old then, and it proved to be eternal. And what's interesting is how those characters that in real life wouldn't have anything to do with each other get along in this small family unit. We didn't get a chance to look for clues. Show them the clue, Shaggy. There was a chemistry of between the characters on Scooby-Doo that was very enlightening and fun. They seemed very organic and natural. They, they just, these four kids just seemed to work together. There was someone there that any kid out there in America or wherever in the world they're watching, they can relate to him. Whether it's a slacker guy or the pretty girl or the rainy girl or the dog that talks. <laughs> The other characters seem to be sort of the balance, and they, they ground you and sort of rounds out the audience that's watching the show. Scooby brings them a part of the game because the, the dogs relate with humans, so whoever's watching that television, Scooby's bringing you in. Well, it would be nice if I could be a teenager and drive around my own van, and it would be nice if I could, you know, eat a lot of my favorite food, and it would be nice if I could, you know, have friends and, you know, run from ghosts but not really get scared or hurt. Vibes? Double yipes! Let's get out of here! Kids are trying to figure out the world, and they're a little anxious about it. Sometimes it seems unknown and scary. And the concept of Scooby is that you take the scary thing, you look at it, 
and you pull the rubber mask off and you find that it's not so scary after all. The fact that it's never too horribly scary is a good thing for kids because they need to feel safe, but they need to let their imaginations kind of run away. We never tried to make the shows scary to where they would really be frightening to kids. <laughs> I suppose you want me to take a look. It was really done with the thought of Abbott and Costello. You know, meet Frankenstein, meet Dracula. It's rare that you have a show that can entertain and have this mystery side and action side while still, you know, giving a good message for young kids. It allows small kids to enjoy monsters and creatures and ghosts, but at the end of every episode, they always explain to you that there's no such thing. And kids want things to be scary, just not, but not dangerously so. So they can know that they have that excitement, that thrill, that energy of, that's scary, but it's okay because the monster's really gonna be the gardener. This can only be one person. Hank! Yeah, that big reveal at the end, it's always like, oh, it's just Mr. Withers. <laughs> Hank! Nabbit. One of the reasons that the formula of Scooby-Doo didn't bother viewers, I think, was that kids are used to seeing the same episode again and again anyway. Eventually, they all become formula because you've seen them 143 times. Kids love repetition, and it doesn't occur to them from week to week that maybe Scooby and the gang has figured out this is not a real ghost or monster chasing them. I'm a great believer in the formula. <laughs> There's a monster, I'm scared out of my mind. They treat it as a real witch or a goblin. Let's get to the bottom of this gang and let's split up. After they've lured it into a crazy Rube Goldberg-like trap, only then can the unmasking take place. Sometimes that guy then takes off two masks and we find out it was not only that guy, but it was that guy pretending to be that guy. Who always says, you know, you pesky, I would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for you pesky kids and your dogs. These things are very mannered at that, at that point. By episode three, it's sort of like, no, no, there are rules that you must adhere to. <laughs> Well, it's still early. Why don't we go into the ghost town and take a look around? You don't know what kind of monster it's going to be. You don't know where they're going. You don't know where they're going to be running back and forth between the doors. But you know all of these things are going to happen. Putting them in different situations and redressing the set and basically different adventure, but, but holding true to the personalities that they had created seemed to be the magic. I knew it all the time. <laughs> oh, brother. The mysteries just were bookends for all the stuff that went in between. They want to see Shaggy and Scooby working together. And they love it when they kind of screw up or do it or they find themselves in danger. That was the real fun part of the show for us. Well, I look. How do you look? I don't see any difference. <laughs> Once you get that formula down, it's kind of reassuring to the audience to have it repeated. They, they know that there's an answer to the question someplace. They're playing along with the game, uh, and they like to guess the answer. When you're a small kid watching this, it makes you feel smart. It makes you feel good about watching the show. It's that one old guy who has the same voice as the monster. I know who it is. It's like that Dagwood sandwich that they make, you know? It's got all the little ingredients, and you know, you know, you kind of know what it's gonna be, and it feels good. That formula seems to work. It's comforting. It's like comfort food. how many different incarnations Scooby has taken on. He's really stood the test of time and kind of been able to be plugged into all different situations. Scooby-Doo is a name that I believe uh, upwards of 100% of the population are familiar with. When a character is as iconic as Scooby is, it's fun to get in and play with it. This was one of the shows I grew up watching, and here I am, I've got a shot to write it. So, you know, how do I have a little bit of fun with it? But you also want to sort of be part of that legacy as well. So it, there, everybody wants to take a stab at Scooby. I personally wanted Johnny Bravo to meet Scooby-Doo because I was a huge Scooby-Doo fan. I asked, can Joe Barbera be on my, you know, help us? Can, can he work on the show as well? Like, sure. So Joe Barrera was actually part of our writing staff for a little time being. We had the help of Iwo Takamoto. He helped uh, design the backgrounds and the look of it. I wanted it to be authentic to what Scooby-Doo was. We would stage things so that we could use the stock animation. Like, there's this one scene where they're all entering the haunted house. We'd look at shows. We'd make sure the layouts were correct. We got the original voice actors. It was just great. When we aspire 
to do things different and to add to what we already know to be true about the franchise and about the characters than we are doing what Joe Barbera did in the moment. He said, well, let's put it all together. I had no idea how many episodes of Scooby-Doo there are out in this world. I mean, there are thousands. <laughs> the fact that we get to bring their characters to life yet again in another incarnation is just an honor. I definitely based my character mostly off the cartoon because I thought it was important to really go back um, to the root, to the original. I have a great amount of respect for everybody that has been a part of this previously because I now know what it's like to try to portray a cartoon. <laughs> we are just entirely uh, energized every day by the possibilities that this franchise still offers. Scooby has been around for so long that it's, a, it's something that everybody has been exposed to. It's, it's part of the, uh, the pop culture experience. People that don't even watch it will make references to it. They talk about, you know, will you do it for a Scooby snack? Or, and I would have gotten away with it too if it hadn't been for those pesky kids. We all know what they mean when they call somebody the Scoobies. We all know what it means when a character's in trouble in an action movie and says, ruh oh. Ruh oh. Rut Row is now, like, I mean, it's probably in Bartlett's familiar quotations. Give me liberty or give me pizza pie. <laughs> if you make a Scooby-Doo reference, you know 95% of your audience knows what you're talking about. If you make a historical reference, you know, it's 50%. If you make a reference to any other show that was popular when you were a kid, it's 5%. Specifically because the people making those movies and television shows all grew up with some influence of Scooby. Because everybody's been exposed to it, it's a touchstone that it, that the audience has. They go, ah, I know what that is. It's a kind of a really cool feeling when you when you hear somebody emulating Scooby. Right, right. You know, <laughs> and and do something funny to a Scooby Doo. I think it's just no different than you know baseball and uh, apple pie. You almost uh, would be surprised that they didn't make references to it. Whether it's an homage, or whether it's just totally mocking it, or whether it's uh, you know admiring what it came from, all of it is complimentary, I think, to the original concept and how it just took off. <laughs> Don't look now, fans, but I think a star is about to be born. <laughs> There seems to be something about Scooby that is universal. Scooby is so popular worldwide because it just translates easy. It's such a primal, simple concept. Who doesn't love food, being scared, and um, a hot van? <laughs> Wonder what it's like on a Saturday night. Kids really are the same across the world as far as their insecurities and their desire to be part of a group and their be being able to look at a character and say, I'm like that, or um, I could be like that and that would be okay. He's very much grilled cheese sandwiches, Scooby-Doo. I don't know if in India they like grilled cheese sandwiches, but um, he's, he's curry to India. That's the worst joke I ever heard. I used to do music and I'd tour all over the world singing and I would see it on TV and I just couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, I can't believe Scooby-Doo is on here. And it'd be so interesting to hear all the different versions of what Scooby sounds like in French, in Spanish, in German, in, you know, Italian. The fact that you've got a brand that's crossed cultures and, you know, 160 countries, it's real easy to look at the appeal and the commercial value. Putting Scooby-Doo on a toothbrush or a mug or, you know, just any kind of merchandising is a great idea because everybody loves Scooby-Doo. You're going to sell it to six-year-olds and 60-year-olds. Scooby just has a natural appeal. It makes him popular as a as a pitch mutt. You know, who wouldn't buy a product from a dog? <gasps> that one has Scooby on it. I want the Scooby toothbrush. And if that makes kids brush their teeth, that's a brilliant merchandising idea. Let's put Scooby on the end of the toothbrush. Kids want to take their Scooby-Doo backpack around, their Scooby-Doo iPod case, just because it, it's comfortable to have your friend with you whenever you go. It's a very appealing uh, face in the box. Oh, there's something, there's a character I love. How bad can these be? Scooby Snacks. I believe at some point there were cookies uh, for, for kids, for us, for people that were called Scooby Snacks. So I'm a little disturbed that there's now uh, dog food and people food called Scooby Snacks. Would you do it for a shaggy snack? A little something I whipped up? Uh, a shaggy snack. It's still on the air. You can still buy the DVDs. You can buy new DVDs. There's still new cartoons being made. There's still classic cartoons. So why not latch on and merchandise with them? I think because Scooby-Doo has been on for so long, 
that he runs the gambit in terms of likability and relatability with parents and kids. It's a part of uh, about two generations, maybe three generations childhoods. You know, there are people who are gonna buy this DVD just because Scooby was a part of their childhood and they wanna share it with their kids. You know, when you love something as a kid, you really want to share that experience with your child. We enjoy doing things with our kids and seeing them enjoy it for the first time like we did. It's high energy, just like little kids are, and yet, it's reminiscent for the adults. They grew up with Scooby, so it's a, it's a little nostalgia event for, for them. Uh, so it's, it's really easy, fun family viewing. It's really such a part of my childhood, and it was a part of my sister's childhood and my brother's childhood, and it's so iconic that it, the fact that I was chosen to do that is something that I will treasure for the rest of my life and with my kids someday. People hand them down from one generation to another, and there's only a handful of characters, like Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse, that this is true of. A lot of great cartoon characters are of their time, and they don't transcend it. Scooby-Doo seems to just, just live on and on and on. When you're flipping through TV and you go, oh, I'll just stop and watch that for a second because you want to see how it's changed and it has evolved and yet there's something about it that's still very securely based in the, the concepts that Mr. Hanna, Mr. Barbera came up with back then and it exists still today and that's charming. We've really got to go. What? What's the rush? I think the character will endure because it's an American icon. If you lived in America and you watch television, you've seen Scooby-Doo at some point, and you know the formula, and you know the gags. Scooby and the Scooby Snacks and uh, Shaggy and the whole gang, they're part of our friends and part of our experience. There are going to be new variations on Scooby long beyond our own presence here on the planet, and uh, long may he live. <laughs> downside to say I love Scooby-Doo, you know, everybody loves Scooby-Doo. <laughs>